Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Bethany Theological Seminary. We are gathered this morning largely on Zoom, but there are a few people here in the Nycarry Chapel. And although we are apart from one another physically, we are together the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. There will be two worship songs offered today during this service. One um, will be offered live. One will be recorded. If you are Zooming in, feel free to sing along if you recognize the song. We just ask that you mute your microphone. If you're here in the chapel, feel free to hum along um, or sing loudly in your own head. Let the Spirit lead. The message today will be brought by Dr. Russell H., Professor of Theology and Human Sciences here at Bethany Seminary. Russell will be continuing the faculty sermon series on the theme of active pacifism. After Russell's sermon, we'll allow for a moment of silent reflection that we might sit together with Russell's words. Now, as I've considered the theme that we have been engaging in in the last few weeks, I found myself thinking a lot about something I read while I was a seminary student. It wasn't, I confess, something I read in a book or on a wiki page. They didn't exist back then. But instead, I read it on a door, a door of one of my housemates. It was a hand-lettered sign that simply read, I will do no violence in my peacemaking. At first, that seemed like a redundancy. It seemed like an unnecessary statement to be made. But as I lived with that statement every day, walking past that door, I became, began to understand it as wisdom and as intention. For even people who are committed to pacifism, much less active peacemaking, we are still capable of doing harm. We do not live harmlessly upon the earth or within community or as part of one humanity. And so this morning, I invite you to begin this service with a confession of our brokenness, a seeking of God's grace together, that we may continue to become God's people of peace. Will you please share with me in the prayer that is printed in your bulletin? Before God, with the people of God, I confess to my brokenness, to the ways I wound my life, the lives of others, and the life of the world. Amen. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5 and 6. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your cloak, will give your coat and then give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also a second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be filled with darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? May God bless the reading of this word. Well, this feels strange. I haven't even started speaking and already the room is nearly empty. Usually it takes a few minutes. Uh, Welcome to everyone in Zoomlandia. Uh, so glad you're here. Uh, let us pray. God, I thank you for your omnipresence. Be with each of us in whatever room and condition we find ourselves today. Help us to share this sacred time set apart, and I pray that through and beyond our human efforts, you will speak a gracious word to each one. And this I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> in a society that prized wealth and physical beauty, Claire had an abundance of both, yet interest in neither. Her family owned uh, two spacious homes, a villa in the city and a castle in the country. But Claire ran away from both homes as a teenager, intent on pursuing a life of total poverty. Her decision was a puzzlement to the townspeople. They imagined a different future for Claire. She was, after all, an attractive young woman who had drawn the attention of many young men. Lord Renario de Bernardo testified that he had, on several occasions, asked Claire to marry him, but each time was rebuffed. He offered this humbling recollection to church authorities after her death in 1253. Her test, his testimony was part of the process for declaring Claire a saint. During this canonization process, one odd incident, also from her teenage years, received close inspection. The incident took place on Palm Sunday of the year 1212. As an annual custom, the young ladies of Assisi, dressed in their finest, would process in a formal line to the front of the sanctuary, there each girl would extend her hand and into the outstretched arm, the bishop would lay a palm branch for Palm Sunday. But Claire 
stood stolidly in place. She declined to walk forward with the others. Some moments passed. Perhaps a few murmurs were heard among the congregation. Eventually, the bishop decided he must be the one to move. He came to where she stood, delivered her palm branch, then returned to resume the liturgy. After the service, and then over the years, people speculated about this violation of etiquette. Was Claire simply shy? Was she deeply in prayer? Was she protesting the vanity of social convention? Whatever her reason, the date became important because that evening is when Claire left home to join Francis of Assisi and his band of mendicant friars. With her long hair cut short and her expensive dress exchanged for a rough tunic, she began a way of life characterized by single-eyed devotion to her savior. In time, other young women joined Claire and together they started a religious order complementary to the Franciscans known as the Poor Clares. The name was apt. Their simplicity and poverty were even more austere than that of the brothers. Whereas the friars would leave the friary to beg for alms, Claire wanted her sisters to stay put within the confines of the enclosed community. She wrote, quote, as pilgrims and strangers in this world who serve the Lord in poverty and humility, let them confidently send for alms. If they stayed put, God would provide. People would bring money to them, perhaps like a bishop delivering a palm branch. <clears throat> uh, Rome at first could not agree that this approach was practical, especially for women. Eventually, though, the Pope did affirm the rule of this religious order and granted them the privilegium pubertatis, or privilege of poverty. This privilege included the freedom to own no property or possessions, not even a single pair of shoes. They were free to go barefoot. <clears throat> As the sisters saw it, a simpler life was a freer life, freedom from working for possessions meant you had more time to pursue the work of prayer, which was their anchoring activity. In keeping with the liturgy of hours, formal prayer took place seven times a day. Claire's fellow nuns noted the intensity of her praying, how the tears fell freely, and beyond that, how prayer suffused her life night and day. She came, shall we say, to pray without ceasing as St. Paul had instructed in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Over time, <clears throat> Claire and Francis captured the popular imagination because leading up to what we call the Reformation in Europe, there came to be a widespread sense that everyone, not just priests and monks and nuns, but everyone was called to a higher religious plane. Everyone, not just priests and monks and nuns, but everyone was supposed to pray. Everyone was supposed to read the Sermon on the Mount and try to follow Christ's command to reach perfection or completion, Matthew 5, 48. According to Charles Taylor, this widespread desire to reach the higher plane paved the way for the Reformation, Counter-Reformation, Radical Reformation, and Anabaptism, and in time, Pietism. So certain sensibilities have been passed down. <clears throat> Can I tell you what happened when I met an heir to Claire at Bethany Seminary several years ago? When I first noticed David sitting in the common room, he looked too young to be one of our students. Those students look younger each year. Nestled in a chair, one leg up, both feet barefoot, his long hair falling neatly to the sides of his head, David was reading a book he had gleaned from a table nearby labeled Free Books. I walked past him several times on various errands before deciding to interrupt him to say hello. And then I recognized him. We had met a few years prior in the Chicago area at a meeting of his youth group where I had been a visitor. 
I remember him telling the group that evening, maybe he was in eighth grade uh, at the time, that he wanted to know what it meant to pray without ceasing. What does that mean, he asked the group as an eighth grader, to pray without ceasing? Now on this day when I met him again, David was on a bicycle trip of several hundred miles. His final destination was a Christian community in Illinois where, as their website had said, property is held in common for the good of the members and the kingdom of God. It was an intentional community, a kind of monastic, Protestant monastic site, which evidently closed a few years ago. I had known from observation and from talking to his pastor that David was intelligent, even gifted. He could easily have gone to college, graduate school, pursued a career successfully. David smiled when I mentioned college. He was still captivated by the idea of praying without ceasing, and he did not suppose campus life would be conducive to that aim. I nodded. I could see his point. As David saw it, praying without ceasing, a moment-by-moment sense of God's presence, awareness of God's goodness, clearly called for a practice of simple living. Whatever the ecological import of simple living, whatever it might entail in terms of curtailing consumer desires, for David, simple living meant first and foremost the expansion, not the contraction of desire. It meant the focus of all human desire on one thing, the will of God. And as David believed, the will of God was manifest in Jesus. So we got to talking about the Sermon on the Mount. He told me that a turning point in his spiritual journey took place when he was in high school. He was pondering the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 39. Do not resist an evil person. Do not resist an evil person. And and trying to figure out what that meant. He read various interpretations to try to crack the code to figure out the hidden meaning. Several subtle approaches had failed to convince him. One commentator argued that since people deep down are good and not evil, you can feel free to fight back because you are resisting evil, but not the person per se. He told me, I must confess, I really did not get that one. Other commentators, such as Walter Wink, made much of the first centuries, uh, the sermon's first century context noting that the words of Jesus were directed to an audience of oppressed people. When Jesus tells these oppressed people to turn the other cheek, what does it really mean? Well, typically a person in power would strike a social inferior with the back of the hand. Therefore, turning the other cheek would invite the oppressor to strike again. But this time the oppressor would be forced to use an open hand. And an open hand, according to first century custom, was used against a social equal. On this reading, turning the other cheek meant outsmarting your opponent by causing him to treat you as an equal. In the same vein, if a Roman soldier made you carry his gear, offering to go the extra mile was a way to outmaneuver the soldier. Since the army's legal limit for this kind of enforced labor was one mile post, the second mile would put the soldier in violation of the law and therefore in danger of disciplinary action. Another deft move to outsmart your oppressor, according to some commentators. David's eyes widened as he related this line of interpretation. How is that loving selflessly, he exclaimed. To humiliate the other person like that or or get them in trouble with the law, how is that loving? I was, I was disarmed by his logic. He, he spoke without guile. Instead of trying to crack the code in search of some hidden meaning, he began to ask himself whether if the words were taken at face value, he was able to trust Jesus to this extent. In the end, he decided that do not resist an evil person actually meant do not resist an evil person. He said, if someone wants to take all your possessions or even harm you in any way, you should not resist that evil person in the least. 
really, I thought to myself, and I confess, I repressed a fleeting urge to slap him in the face just to see how he might respond. But I sensed my answer already. If untrained as a biblical scholar, if inexperienced in issues of social oppression, still, David had a kind of knowledge that was unarguable. He knew what these words of Jesus meant to him. Now, I could leave it there and let you ponder. Uh, but in the short time remaining, let me say a word about how I read Claire and David, and uh, in turn, how I read the Sermon on the Mount. Here's how I don't read Claire and David. I don't have a developmental model that says, it's fine, but they'll outgrow it. The energy, idealism, and enthusiasm are good. The, the willingness to drop everything and follow Jesus, whatever the cost. But then you get older and you realize <laughs> life is complicated. You come to seminary and you realize theology is complicated. And so with maturity comes a more realistic and circumspect approach. And that's what I mean by a developmental model. And I don't buy it. And it's, my reason is not just because over-enthusiasm and lack of realism uh, have been the perennial charge leveled against Anabaptists, Pietists, Pentecostals. The reason is that I don't find any support for a tamped-down, socially-adjusted, culturally-conformed version of Christianity in the words of Jesus. Nowhere in the Sermon on the Mount do we read, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, find the happy medium. There are places in life for compromise and the Aristotelian mean. Politics, for example, would be a good place for that. Instead, though, when people become wishy-washy and non-committal about spiritual convictions or void of any deep convictions about God whatsoever, a kind of repressed religious fervor can get redirected and put into political factions. As Aristotle said, a society that relativizes the absolute is in danger of absolutizing the relative. <clears throat> Aristotle didn't say that, I just did. Now, I realize religion and politics can overlap and the fanaticism of a religious state can be even worse. It's, it's complicated. And as for enthusiasm of youth on another day, I would want to say more about the difference between spiritual sobriety and spiritual indolence, because uh, one is good and the other isn't. But my main point here is that I am not being dismissive of David and Claire. Their teenage devotion is not something I deride, but something I still aspire to, even though it can get harder as you get older. And in reading them, I came to what became for me a key to reading this whole Sermon on the Mount, including the business of peacemaking. In the section of Matthew's gospel that Janet just read, Jesus is talking about the law of retribution, an eye for an eye, and which, as you probably know, was meant to be a law of restraint. If someone knocks out your tooth, don't turn around and rip off their whole face. But Jesus reframes the law in terms of love, what we have come to call agape love, love that seeks the best for the other person, love that seeks the best for the other person, even when that other person is your enemy. From there, Jesus moves to topics of prayer and almsgiving. Prayer and almsgiving were crucial topics in first century Judaism, and uh, Jesus reframes these as well. Now, in the midst of the discourse, we come across this verse. I love it. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. This verse, ambiguous though it be, became for me a kind of key to much of the sermon, unlocking so much of its meaning. What is Jesus saying here about the condition of your eye? 
Over the centuries, readers and church teachers have agreed he is talking about spiritual vision. But beyond that, we find variation. If your eye is healthy, if your eye is clear, if your eye is sound, if your eye is generous, it's in the context of almsgiving, if your eye is good. Now, many meanings may be complementary. I think one of the best English translations is actually one of the first. If thine eye be single, if your eye is single, it will illuminate your whole life. In other words, I think Jesus is calling us to a single-eyed focus on what your life is all about. What is the priority? What is the one thing that truly matters? Start there and it will light up everything. Yes, life is complicated, but what is your underlying simplicity? What do you hope to be in life? I hope to be whole, complete, perfect, as my heavenly father is perfect. What are you looking for? What are you really looking for in life? I'm seeking God's kingdom and righteousness. Everything else will take care of itself. Jesus is not just giving us a lot of impossible ethical instructions in the sermon. He is calling us to a single-eyed vision of what life is all about. As Alexander Mack said, every ethic of Jesus comes out of a metaphysic, out of a grounding in God. Mack didn't say that. From this vantage point, simple living is simply loving, simply loving God, clearing out of the way every complicating obstruction to have a moment-by-moment -moment awareness of God's presence, dependence on God's goodness. What is peacemaking? It, too, is loving, agape loving, loving your enemies, wanting the best for the other person. Do not resist an evil person, says Jesus. He speaks these words in the context of seeking retribution and vengeance, and the word resist refers to fighting back, perhaps by legal means. I think in context, Jesus is saying, in the face of evil, do not be focused on how to fight back, but rather how to love back. Love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. Now, we can talk about how that plays out someday. We can talk about passive activism and active pacifism. We can talk about just war and just peace and the extent to which they're getting at the same thing. We can talk about whether it's a good idea to condense complex ethical issues into bumper stickers and about the bumper sticker that says, when Jesus said, love your enemies, he probably meant don't kill them. Probably, maybe not certainly. We are also called to love your neighbor. What do you do when the enemy wants to harm the neighbor horribly? As Jesus says, there are worse things in life than death, physical death. And he really did say that, Matthew 10, 28. <clears throat> of course, if you can prevent the evil without violence, that would be infinitely better. There are many hypotheticals we can talk about, but before we talk, we need to pray. This is what I learned from Claire and David. Any hypothetical ethical discussion needs to start with a real sense of God's presence, at least for the people of Jesus. Before we talk, we need to pray. We need to be able to see Jesus. And to hear him asking, is your eye single? What is it you are looking for in life? What do you really hope to be?
Christ to be in my mind and in my thinking. Christ to be in my eyes, in everything I see. Christ to be in my ears and in my hearing. Christ be in my mouth, in every word I speak. Christ be in my heart, and in my loving. Christ be in my life, each moment that I live. Christ be in my mind, and in my thinking, Christ be in my eyes, in everything I see. Christ be in my ears and in my hearing. Christ be in my mouth, in every word I speak. Christ be in my heart and in my loving. Christ be in my life, each moment that I live. And let us now go in love. And may the light of God oh, Emily, it's, it's surround time. us. Oh, it is time. Fill us. Hi, I'm Emily Shaw. And let the light of God surround us, fill us, and shine within us everywhere we go. Amen. <laughs>